Good morning, everyone. Today is Thursday, June twenty seventh. We're uh, learning Gemara together. Um, this is actually, I noticed, our thirty fourth session of Talmud study, um, which builds on many previous sessions of learning Mishnah through Pirkei Avot and Mishnah Brachot. So, um, those of you who've been with us since the very beginning, uh, congratulate yourself as we end uh, this block of study for this season uh, at how much you've learned and how far we have all come. Uh, for those of you who are newer to our study, we're so happy that you've joined our our little club. Um, so uh, join us as we say a bracha for study. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Um, so I have framed last week's lesson, um, which is up online, by the way, if you weren't able to catch it. And this week's lesson as kind of just like tasty morsel bonuses at the end of uh, a longer unit of study that we approached this spring about the spring holidays. So we kind of went through Purim, Pesach, Shavuot, counting of Omer, um, Revelation at Sinai. And then we paused for a couple of weeks for work obligations on my end. And then last week and this week, we're just doing kind of like two different codas, just favorite passages from the Gemara that I like. They don't necessarily fit into a, a category. So think of it as miscellany. Um, but, you know, a broad understanding of Gemara should include awareness of the passages that we looked at last week from uh, Tractate Chagiga. Um, and now uh, this week, we're looking at a section from Tractate Brachot, uh, sorry, Tractate Shabbat, rather, 33b into 34a. Uh, so that's the passage we're going to look at. Um, and we're going to start... Uh, together once I figure out how to share my screen. Okay, so here is Shabbat 33b um, on Safaria. It's numbered as paragraph number five. You can see my little cursor over here. Uh, I'm actually picking up here at this sentence, which is where the, the passage begins that I'd like us to contemplate this morning. So uh, okay, so let's take a look here. Diyatvi Rabbi Yehuda the Rabbi Yose the Rabbi Shimon. Diyatvi means that uh, they were sitting. Uh, Yatvi is the Aramaic uh, word for Yoshev, which means to sit. Uh, Lashevet is the Hebrew word, the Hebrew infinitive form of the verb to sit. In Aramaic, it's Diyatvi. They were sitting. Uh, who were sitting? Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yose, Rabbi Shimon. So it just means like once upon a time, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yosi, and Rabbi Shimon were all hanging out, right? The Yatev Yehuda, Ben Gerim, uh, Gabaihu. So um, it says that Rabbi Yehuda, who happens to be, this is interesting, you can see this here, a Ben Gerim. Uh, he's the right here, he's the son of converts. Yehuda ben Gerim, and, and when the little dotted line pops up underneath a name over which your cursor is hovering, you can click it and get a little information. And in this case, there's no known information about who this Judah son of converts is. Uh, so what Rabbi Yehuda are we talking about? Not clear. Um, and Gabaihu literally means he was sitting on their backs, but it just means next to them, right? So um, so you have three rabbis and then a fourth figure, Yehuda ben Gerim, is next door. Patach Rabbi Yehuda v'Amar. So the, the, and the, the confusion is there are two Yehudas in this passage, but it's a pretty common name. So you have Rabbi Yehuda, this fellow, clicking on him, one of the most prolific scholars of the Mishnaic period, cited almost 3,000 times in the Tana Itik, that is the early the Mishnaic literature, uh, taught by Rabbi Tarfon and others. Um, and he was the interlocutor with Rome um, and with the Roman authorities. So a very, very important uh, figure. Uh, this is Rabbi Yehuda ben Eli. Uh, so Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Shimon, let's find out who the three are all together. This is Rabbi Yossi ben Chalafta, also a fifth generation Tana, uh, a disciple of Rabbi Akiva, an authority in transmitting Akiva's teachings to the next generation and compiling Seder Olam, a classical compendium of Jewish uh, history. So, okay, thank you, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, and this fellow Rabbi 
Shimon Bar Yochai, um, another very prominent fifth generation Tana, also a student of Rabbi Akiva, key scholar in the, in the next generation after Akiva. And this is the important line. I think this is necessary context. Through his involvement in mysticism and his reputed authorship of the Zohar, you need to take that with a very hefty heaping of salt. Um, the Zohar, which is the chief work of Jewish mysticism, um, or Kabbalah, is composed in Spain in the 13th century. So Shimon Bar Yochai, who lives in the second century, is definitively not the author of the Zohar. However, the Zohar itself postures as a recovered work that was written by Shimon Bar Yochai when he was hanging out in a cave. And we're going to learn about what Shimon Bar Yochai was doing in that cave. But the, the legend in Jewish tradition is that the second generation sage, Shimon Bar Yochai, is sequestered in a cave, as we're going to read today, for a very long time. And when he emerges, he's produced this incredible work of spiritual insight known as the Zohar, which again is the cornerstone of Jewish Kabbalistic tradition, or Jewish mystical tradition. Mystics, or Kabbalists in the Jewish tradition, being the predominant sect of Jews, or it's, it's a spiritual discipline within the master tradition of Judaism that is all about direct experience of the divine. Like all religions have their mystics, and all the mystics are the folks in any religious uh, organization or orientation who are chiefly preoccupied with having a direct encounter with God. Like that can be accomplished through prayer, through meditation, through study, through mantras, through the use of psychedelic substances, through music and chanting, through breathing exercises. Like there are all sorts of things that mystics can and do, in fact, do to accomplish their religious objective, which is, again, to have a direct experience of the divine. I don't want to sit in a study hall and talk about God. As George Harrison, the mystic of the Beatles, would have said, I really want to know you. I really want to see you. I really want to be with you, my Lord. Right? That's the idea. That's what a mystic thinks and does. So Shimon Bar Yochai is, in Jewish legend and Jewish imagination, revered as the kind of father figure of Jewish mysticism. But there is absolutely, you know, quantitative proof that Shimon Bar Yochai did not write the Zohar, which has been, you know, definitively identified as a 13th century work. So we're off by 1100 years here. But it's also the way in which the Zohar affirms its own authority and legitimacy within the Jewish tradition by saying, hey, don't take it from some anonymous 13th century rabbi who wrote this in Spain. This is a document that we found that was written by the very hand of Shimon Bar Yochai when he was having a mystical kind of conversionary experience secreted away in a cave for a very long time about which we shall read this morning. Okay, so these are the three figures. Uh, Yehuda uh, Bar Eli, right? Do I have that right? Yehuda Bar Eli, um, Rabbi Yossi Ben Chalafta, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay, they're all sitting around with a guy named Yehuda Ben Gerim, the Judah, the son of converts, who we don't know much about. Patach Rabbi Yehuda ve'amar. So Rabbi Judah opened up his discourse, Patach, to open, ve'amar, and said, Kama na'im ma'asehen shel umazo. How lovely, how beautiful, kama na'im, ma'asehen, are the deeds from ose, ma'ase, is a deed or an action, are the, the doings, shel umazo, of this nation. All right, how pleasant are the actions of this nation? And as Shine Salt helpfully reminds us, we're talking about the Romans. And I'm going to pick up here in the English. So he's, they're sitting around in, you know, Roman-occupied Judea. And uh, they are, or possibly in the Galilee. And they're admiring all that the Romans have done for this part of the world. Look, they establish marketplaces, they build bridges, they establish bathhouses. Wow, like, look at, look at our civilization. Unbelievable, it's marvelous. Rabbi Yossi was silent. He had nothing to say. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai responded and said, everything that they, meaning the Romans, established, they established only for their own purposes. This was totally self-serving 
uh, on the part of the Romans. They established marketplaces, yes, but in order to place prostitutes in them. They established bathhouses, and yes, but to pamper themselves. And they built bridges so that they could collect taxes from all who pass over them, right? They only are building this infrastructure for the sake of, uh, I think, debasing the society that they have colonized and taking their money and their resources. Now, remember this guy who's been sitting with them, Yehuda ben Gerim, Yehuda the son of converts, went and related their statements to his household. So he's been listening to these three prominent rabbis holding forth on, look at what the Romans built. Yes, but look at why they built it. He goes home and relates this conversation to his family. And those statements continued to spread until they were heard by the monarchy. So the way rumors do, word gets around. So this Yehuda son of converts starts spreading the word. And before long, it reaches the Roman authorities who ruled and said, Yehuda, who elevated the Roman regime, shall be elevated. So they heard the story that Yehuda ben Eli, again, this fellow, um, this is totally wrong. This is a totally wrong footnote. That we're not talking about biblical Yehuda. We're talking about, sorry, so that's very interesting. Safari, I should tell them there's a mistake here. No, we're clearly not talking about the Bible's Judah. We're talking about Rabbi Judah ben Eli, one of the three sages, the one who said, look at all, look at what the Romans built. Isn't it marvelous? He shall be elevated because he said something nice about Rome. This is very, you know, Trumpian. He, the, clearly the value is on if you praise the regime, you'll get rewarded for it. So the Romans, uh, possibly also being somewhat thin-skinned narcissists, take this praise from this rabbi and say, let's lift up this rabbi's stature because he said something nice about our regime and appointed as head of the sages. So we're going to make this Judah the chief sage for the Jewish people. And remember, I think, yeah, let's click up here where the link is actually correct. This is the guy who is the uh, interlocutor with the Romans, right? So if you see from the footnote there, due to his conciliatory attitude toward the Romans, which you actually read about in this text, they, meaning the Romans, decreed that he would speak first at rabbinic convocations. He becomes the official spokesperson for the Jewish people. Um, and Yossi, who remains silent, because remember, of the three rabbis, one speaks in favor of Rome, one remains silent, and one denounces Rome. Yossi, who remains silent, shall be exiled from his home in Judea as punishment and sent to the city of Tsipori in the Galilee, which is very interesting because presumably his home in Judea is more of a kind of Jewish enclave, not to the same degree of Roman assimilation as Sipori. And some of you have actually visited Sipori in the Holy Land. Some of you have even traveled with me to Israel on a temple trip and have visited Sipori. It's one of my favorite places in Israel. It was the site of a prominent uh, community of rabbis in the Mishnaic period. So it was one of the early places where the rabbinic uh, study uh, rabbinic academies proliferated in the first and second centuries of the common era, even before the Bar Kokhba revolt. And it was also archaeologists and scholars have uncovered um, a city of uncommon interaction and interchange among Jews and Christians and pagan Romans. Like we have evidence of all three of these groups living in a very, very kind of like interesting urban environment uh, in the northern central part of Israel. Like this is to the significant, it's probably about an hour, hour and a half northwest, sorry, northeast of Tel Aviv. So Sipori, beautiful, surrounded by, you know, lush green countryside in the, in the warmer months. Uh, actually throughout the year, it's pretty lush. Um, and a really interesting city because you can find evidence of uh, a rabbinic community, a Jewish community, a Christian community, an early Christian community, and also uh, a Roman community. And it seems like they were all, at least for some limited duration, working together, living together in some way that resembled order and function. Um, 
so, but Yossi is going to be exiled from his home in this Jewish enclave, presumably in Judea, and sent to Tsipori up north, where he will presumably have to have more, the expectation would be he would have to be more assimilated into Roman dominated society. And Shimon, who denounced the government, shall be killed. So that's that's the harsh decree at the end of this paragraph. All right, I'm going to keep reading and then we'll pause for comments and questions. So, Azal who uvre. So, uh, he, meaning Rabbi Shimon, fled. Azal who means he got up and, and it's Aramaic. Uvre means bar shalom in Hebrew or ben shalom. Ben meaning son and shalom, the suffix that means his or beno. We would say beno in Hebrew. Beno in Aramaic is bere. So he and his son fled. Um, and then it's here, it says, uh, Tosho be Midrasha. And they hid in the Beit Midrash. Again, we're still in Aramaic, but some of these words you can even pick out in Aramaic. They toshod, which means they hid in the Beit Midrasha, which is the Beit Midrash in Hebrew. Kol yoma hava matia luhu. Okay, so every single day, uh, Rabbi Shimon's wife would bring them Devetu from the house, from their house, Rifta Vechuza Demaya Vecharchi. Okay, so as I said, she would bring them a bread, some bread and a jug of water, and they would eat. So they were hiding from the Romans in the Beit Midrash, and they were being fed by Eleazar's, uh, sorry, by Shimon's wife. She would come from the house with a little bread and water to make sure that her husband and their son were safe and fed. All right. When the decree intensified, presumably, I assume this means uh, when the Romans became even more determined to root out the fugitives who have abs uh, who have absented themselves uh, from the situation by hiding in the Beit Midrash and are now on the lam. Um, Rabbi Shimon says to his son, women are easily impressionable, and therefore there is room for concern lest the authorities torture her and she reveal our whereabouts. Did this need the misogynistic insult? No. Does it include it and I can't avoid it? Yes. Um, so he, he, he kind of takes a swipe, not at his wife personally, but saying, look, she's a woman, she's weak-willed. And what's going to happen is the Romans, now that they're really determined to get out there and get us, they're going to find her, they're going to torture her, and they're going to extract the information about where her husband and son are hiding. Um, because she's been, you know, aiding and abetting these fugitives. So um, they went and they hid in a cave. So they decide it's no longer safe for them to hang out in the Beit Midrash. And of course, the, the curious reader wants to know, well, wait a minute, how did they survive? No more Mrs. Shimon to bring them bread and water. Which reminds me, by the way, just as a funny side note, you know, um, when Henry David Thoreau wrote Walden, uh, which was all about like his sequestering himself on Walden Pond and contemplating the universe. Um, and he makes it out like he was this scrappy, very like rugged individual who's able to survive out there on his own. It turns out that like every week, Ralph Waldo Emerson's mother would bring him like a care package of cookies and stuff like that. This is true. So he was getting like a Jewish mother care package from not a Jewish mother, but from Ralph Waldo Emerson's mom. True story. Okay. Anyway, they decide it's no longer safe to hide in the Beit Midrash. So sorry, Mrs. Shimon, we're going to go hide in a cave. And of course, the curious reader wants to know, well, how did they live? Well, a miracle occurred. A miracle occurred and a carob tree was created for them as well as a spring of water. So now... The legend allows for us to suspend any disbelief and say, okay, that's how they subsisted. They're hiding in the cave, but they've got a carob tree and a spring of fresh water. They would remove their clothes, so they'd get all naked, and they'd sit in sand up to their necks. They would study all Torah all day in that manner. Okay, suspend a lot of disbelief, but they were hiding from the Romans in a cave, buried in sand up to here, facing each other talking Torah all day long. How could they study Torah without the text in front of them? Of course, they had it memorized. 
the whole text of the Torah, right? So these are the great sages of their generation, and this is how they keep themselves sane. You ask, the, the readers should ask, are they sane or are they insane? Uh, at the time of prayer, when it was time to daven, they would dress, they'd get out of the sand pit, cover themselves, and pray. And then afterward, they would take off all their clothes, and uh, the clothes would be preserved. And they sat this way doing this cave thing for 12 years. All right, that's how long Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, who again are on the lam from the Roman authorities who want to execute them for denouncing Rome, they sat that way for 12 years. Elijah comes to them. So Eliyahu Hanavi shows up um, after 12 years and stands at the entrance to the cave and he says, who will inform Bar Yochai, Shimon Bar Yochai, that the emperor has died and therefore the decree has been abrogated? So the forgive the intentionally uh, jumbled lexicon here, but the fatwa against them has been lifted with the death of the emperor and they can safely come out of the cave. Okay, I'll stop here for just a second. Is everyone following the story? Are there any questions just on a Peshat level, just on a kind of like what's happening to whom, when, and why thus far? Anything you'd like to clarify before we move on? Yep, mom and dad. Mm. Unmute, please. Sorry. Is there any meaning to be taken from the fact that the rat fink was the son of converts? That's a really good question. And the answer is, I don't know. Because he doesn't really come up again in this section. And nothing else is known about him. Um, it is, you know, you have to question it because the the reader's orientation to this literature is that no detail is mentioned for no reason. Right. So is this a diss on converts in general? Possibly. And again, I'm, I'm not sure that he thought, though, the text doesn't make it clear that he was trying to rat them out. It's just, he said, wow, you'll never believe what I saw today. Three rabbis sitting around, one praising Rome, one remaining silent, one dissing Rome. But it is an interesting detail that this this other Yehuda, this layperson Yehuda, not a rabbi, is a Ben Gerim, is a son of converts. Does that mean that he is already diminished in the eyes of the Gemara? Possibly, but again, all we have is the text. So this is a make your own conclusion. Um, great. Okay, so let's let's pick up. All right, so we got this. Oh, Joe, do you want to comment here? Unmute, unmute. usually in the lower left. Yep, there you go. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, if he was in this, if uh, he and his son were in the cave, see, sort of secretly, who who else knew about it and was able to report about how they were in the sand and what they did with Torah? And then, it, and then at the end, uh, how did, how did uh, Elijah find them? Right. Okay. Well, again, all of this is just conjecture. One, much of what is reported in the Gemara is reported in the kind of omniscient third person narrative voice, right? This is what's known in the Gemara as the stum, which means the kind of plain or, or kind of like the stum just means the simple voice in this case. But the stum means the anonymous narrative voice that narrates the actions of the characters in a third person uh, frame without necessarily requiring of the reader that you assume that the narrative voice was, that the narrator was there to eyewitness it, right? So there's just a lot that's written in the Talmud that just says, here's what happened with these sages. And the anonymous third person narrative voice of the Talmud is the one telling us this. And that's why we accept it. And we're like, okay, the stomp. They're like, how do we know this? The stomp. And that's important as a distinction from a contradistinction from the way much of the Talmud is written that says, I heard from Rabbi so and so who did or said such and so, right? There's a lot of the Talmud that actually attributes who is seeing and saying. Much of the Talmud is also not written that way. And that's what we call the stum 
or the uh, third person anonymous narrative voice of the Talmud. Uh, as for Elijah, well, this is kind of Elijah's gig, right? Like Elijah is not a, a mortal human. Elijah is the one prophet in the Hebrew Bible who does not die. I mean, definitively does not die. If you read the stories of Elijah, which are recorded in the books of, I think, Samuel and definitely in the books of Kings, Kings 1 and Kings 2, Elijah is a prophet. Unlike, for instance, other prophets whose names may be familiar, let's take the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah doesn't leave us a book. Elijah is recorded throughout this part of the Hebrew Bible as a kind of folkloric figure. So we learn a lot about the doings and sayings of Elijah in the Bible. We don't actually have a book of his teachings. Similarly, or I should say, Contra that, we have a book called Isaiah, which tells you what was on the mind of a prophet named Isaiah, probably several prophets who identified with the school of Isaiah, but but we don't have like narratives about the life and times of Isaiah. So it's, it's inverted, right? <laughs> Elijah is a character in the Bible. And at the end of Elijah's life, having appointed Elisha as his disciple, who's going to carry on his prophetic mission, Elijah, alive, gets swept up into the heavens in a whirlwind. And therefore, all the legends, post-biblical legends about Elijah, arise from this strange fact that he didn't die. And therefore, he's still around, and that he will come back to announce important stuff. Most importantly, Elijah comes back to announce the coming of the Messiah. That's his main function in Jewish tradition, that Elijah is the herald of Mashiach. And that's why, by the way, I mean, lots of things arise where that's why we invoke him on Pesach, because at the end of the Seder, we invoke like Elijah, as it were, comes to visit your Seder to say, and so someday soon, right? we will all be redeemed because Messiah will come back. We won't be living in Roman exile anymore doing the Seder thing. We'll have a rebuilt temple, which is the meaning of the song, Adir Hu, Adir Hu. Blessed is God, great is God, which means may God build the temple right now. Like that's literally what we're asking in Adir Hu. For all of you Reformed Jews who don't know what you're singing about, please God rebuild the temple. That's Adir Hu on Pesach. And that's right around the time that Elijah comes back to say, hey, Messiah's on his way. Elijah also pops up at Havdalah as if to say, you just had this Shabbat. Shabbat is like an appetizer portion of the world to come. And the Messiah is going to come back to make the whole world like endless Shabbat. And we have a chair set aside for Elijah when we do a bris, as if to say, this child is part of the redemption of the world when the Messiah comes, this imp -ba -ba. Um, And then throughout the legends, Elijah is always popping up in the Talmud. What this has to do with messianic redemption, I'll let you surmise after we read a bit more. Barbara. Um. I'm curious about the word stum, because in modern Hebrew, you use the word stum all the time. Right. Like it means in modern Hebrew, it's say, like, a, or you can't explain it, you say stum. It just is, right? Just the stum yeah. is like, it is what it is. So it's the same word. Same word. And that's right. I mean, think about it. It's like, it's the, it's just what it is voice of the Talmud. It's like, like it doesn't have a name. It seems to know everything. So it's the anonymous narrator. Hmm. Okay. And that survived so many thousands of years. Indeed. Hmm. All right. I'm going to call this up. Let's enlarge the print a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So Elijah came and says, oh, who's going to tell these folks that the emperor is dead and they can come out of the cave safely? Now, here's where the story gets interesting. It's already an interesting story, but here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. Nafku Chazo Inashe de Kadrabi, sorry, Karvi, Vizari, Amrin, Manichin Chaye Olam, Ve Oskin Bechaye Sha. All right, so this is how we translate that verse. They came out of the cave and they Chazu Inashe, they saw people. Chazo means they gazed upon Inashe, is Aramaic for Anashim, people. They saw people plowing and sowing. So they see people going about agriculture. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, remember, he's the one who insulted Rome in the first place. So he's the one they really want, but he's been 
he basically kidnapped his son into this escapade as well. So he's been hanging out with his kid in the cave for 12 years. The first thing he sees is he gets out of the cave, you, you know, he adjusts his eyes to the light, and he sees people are going about their business plowing and sowing. And he says, these people abandon the eternal life of Torah study and engage in temporal life for their own sustenance. Remember, this is the same guy who dissed Roman uh, marketplaces, bathhouses, and um, bridges. All this infrastructure that the Romans built 12 years earlier, 12 years and change, because who knows how long he was hiding in the Beit Midrash getting meals from Mrs. Emerson. No, from his wife. Um, so he's been 12 years. And remember what they're doing in this cave. Nothing but davening and hiding in a sand pit naked, studying okay. Torah all day long. Like this is what has. Been, so think about like, what would that do to a person? This person was a little extreme in his views beforehand. How does he emerge? And one of the questions I want us to contemplate is, what is a life of Torah study supposed to look like? Like, what are we supposed to get out of this? That's why I brought this as our last session before summer break. Really something to chew on. Okay. And he's enraged. So he says, I can't believe it. These people are focused on farming. They are only focused on temporal life for their own sustenance. All they care about is like putting food on the table. Can you believe it? The Gemara then relates that every place that Rabbi Shimon and his son, Rabbi Elazar, directed their eyes was immediately burned. So he's become like this Godzilla-like, or I don't know, what's the, the Japanese like monster with the that shoots lasers from its eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes around just burning stuff with his gaze. A bot coal comes out. So here's our divine voice. We've seen this before and says to these two fellows. So the, the, the senior Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, Rabbi Elazar. Both very prominent sages, by the way. Let's learn about his son. What's interesting, because up until this point, he hasn't been identified by name. It's just Beno or Bare in Aramaic. It's his son. But now he's emerged and he's a rabbi. He's a full-fledged rabbi, not just any rabbi. He's a really important rabbi. Um, but this is interesting. Yeah, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua, which probably means uh, Rabbi Elazar ben Shimon. It's probably the same guy. Uh, they say he's a devoted studa, student of Akiva. He stayed with Akiva even when Akiva was awaiting execution by the Romans. Akiva is one of the 10 martyrs of Rome at the time of the Bar Kokhba revolt, which fails. He then leaves Palestine, returns to set up an academy in the Galilee. Uh, very, very prominent sages and eventually is also executed by the Romans. But that's the story around his son. All right. Abat Kol comes out and says... Did you emerge from the cave in order to destroy my world? It's like, what the heck, man? Go back in the cave. So God basically orders them back into the cave. And they sat there for another year, another 12 months. They've already been there for 12 years. So now it's the end of year 13. They said, these, this rabbi son, this two rabbi pair, father son, the judgment of the wicked in Gehenna, even in hell, the wicked are punished for 12 months. Surely their sin was atoned in that time is what Steinsalt provides. In other words, they say, I think that we've had enough punishment. So they're back in the cave for 12 months and they're like, okay, I think we've gotten the point. A divine voice emerged and said to them, emerge from your cave. I said, okay, I agree. Your sin is atoned for, come out of the cave. And now something has changed. Everywhere that Rabbi Elazar would strike, Rabbi Shimon would heal. So they're still going about the world, but now they're using their apparently like supernatural mystical powers, one to harm and one to heal. Rabbi Shimon said to Rabbi Elazar, my son, you and I suffice for the entire world as now the two of us are engaged in the proper study of Torah. Now there's more, there's going to be more on this passage. Um, but I, I want to stop here because there's so much to unpack. So do we need to recap or are people pretty clear on what's happening here? But let's take questions or comments at this point. Like, what is this passage about? Because clearly to take this passage literally, I think would be to miss 
the point of this literature. This literature is, in my view, clearly crying out to be interpreted allegorically. What are what are we supposed to take away from this passage? All right, let's let's just do some popcorn style responding to the text. Mom and Dad, you have the hand up first. Well, I'll jump in <laughs> as usual. Um, I'm reminded of the uh, simple phrase, uh, "Ain kema, ain Torah." Great. I'd have to get the citation, but "Ain kema, ain Torah." Do you know the translation? Uh, without bread, you can't have Torah. Right. And the opposite is true. Without Torah, you can't have bread. Right. It, and it does say that in the text as well. Um, I think it's a Talmudic line, don't quote me, but it means without flour, without meal, without bread, there is no Torah. And then it says, in Torah, in Kemach, like without Torah, there is no bread. So there needs to be a almost a 50-50 balance between material pursuit and spiritual pursuit, right? So clearly, when Elazar and Shimon first emerge from the cave, and they are incredibly vexed by this, you know, obscenity. I'm kind of laughing at it, but that's how Shimon appears to react to this. This obscenity that these people are farming of all things. How are they spending all day farming when they should be studying Torah? Now, by the way, you may be starting to catch a little bit of my political meta text drift on this. Because there's been a very important news development in Israel requiring that the ultra-Orthodox send their young people into the army, like everyone else who is a citizen of Israel. Um, this was a unanimous, I don't know if it was all 15 people, it was a unanimous Israel, I think it was, like a historic, unprecedented, unanimous Supreme Court decision um, that, by the way, was part of the reason that before October 6th, Netanyahu and his government coalition cronies spent the whole previous year since coming to power trying to dismantle the Supreme Court. This was one of the things they were worried about. They were worried that the Supreme Court would in fact hear this case and would in fact rule exactly as it did rule, which is that the Haredi also have to participate in army service. They also have to serve in the IDF. This satisfies the the long-held desire of a strong majority of the Israeli public. Especially imagine that you're a parent, one of countless parents in Israel right now, with a son or a daughter who's serving in wartime. The idea that there are, uh, you know, millions, uh, you know, a minority to be sure, but there are a lot of people who are exempt from army service because their religious community upholds the idea that by studying Torah, they're doing as much for the defense of the state of Israel as the kids who are strapping on uniform and weapons. That's the premise, right? And that has been a deal that was cut with Ben-Gurion that the Supreme Court, you know, we're, we're going back 75 years to the founding of 77, years, whatever, that when there were 6,000 of these religious fanatics, Haredi, uh, I'm not even sure that's the word that would have been used at the time of the founding of the state of Israel. But Ben-Gurion made this concession thinking, what 6,000 religious fanatics to you and me? Not playing the long game, one of the few places where Ben-Gurion, I think, did not play the long game and did not have the vision to see that this could be a huge problem decades down the road, which, of course, it has become. So I am, however, I as I was thinking about, well, what text can I bring this week? I said, wow. This text has a lot to say about this thing that's happening right now. It's like, do we in fact accept the idea that it is Jewish to devote your life to this one thing, the study of Torah, and to disdain all earthly pursuits? Because, as my dad correctly observes and cites from other Jewish texts, in Kemach and Torah, with, without the ability to like engage in the things that sustain the body, and that could mean the body of the person, flour, meal, food. How can you study Torah? Like Torah needs, a, you need to be alive. You need to be working. You need to like have a life. Torah can't be the only thing. It also goes on to say, by the way, but without the store study of Torah, there's no flour, which may not be literally true, but may also be figuratively true. Like without the pursuit of something 
noble and that that feeds the soul and not the body what's the point of feeding yourself at all that's one way of understanding the flip side of that phrase but clearly the talmud the stam the anonymous voice of the talmud does not venerate shimon bar yochai for going out into the world getting all hot and bothered that people are doing this farming thing oh my god can you believe it they're not studying torah they're farming and decides that he's just going to gaze upon people and burn them with his laser eyes. Like, clearly God doesn't like that, which is why the Talmud invents or interposes the botkol, the divine voice, to say, you know what? You guys need some more time in the cave to figure this out. This is not what I had in mind. Like, I see that something has happened in this cave. But what has happened in this cave? You've become religious fanatics. You've become intolerant nutjobs. And you've used the Torah to get there, by the way. But not just Torah, by the way. Torah plus a cave plus hiding in a sand pit. Like, just look at the allegory here. You have, you know, almost comical way. Like, you could make a graphic novel out of this or a comic book. Like, these two dudes hiding in a sand pit all day, getting out to clothe themselves only to daven, and then going right back. Literally, like, we even use this phrase, with their heads in the sand, to mean oblivious, like, shutting off the reality of the world around them. It's not just there. At this point, they're no longer just hiding in fear of their lives. They've created this kind of sequestered, isolated enclave where they can't be touched by the poison of secular of the secular Roman world. Which, by the way, includes things that people need. Bridges and bathhouses and marketplaces. I remember how this whole escapade gets started okay let's hear a little bit more now that we're unpacking it audrey okay i just um want to say that i remember reading in the beginning the first days after october 7th that some of the orthodox left their yeshiva and went into the agricultural fields to back up what the others were doing you know those who had to leave to serve were those who were in agriculture couldn't keep doing that. So they filled in there. But also it just occurred to me, uh, my uncle uh, escaped Germany and was here and he was ultra, ultra, ultra Orthodox. His son is the Rebbe in Lakewood and he served in the American army in Europe. And right. if he couldn't get kosher food, he didn't eat. He would have water or whatever he could manage. I remember them saying this in Yiddish, but somebody translated it at his funeral, that he didn't shirk that responsibility. So, And there's nobody more extreme than he was. So I don't think it has to be. Yeah, and I would say that like that gives us a window into a kind of what I think is best understood through a sociological lens, which is that the religious communities of the world, but let's just keep our focus on the Jews, have become more extreme since World War II. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You see that everywhere. And I think that some of that, uh, probably all of that, derives from the way in which the ultra-religious were more traumatized by the Holocaust than any other part of the Jewish world. Really? So in addition to already being at the extremes of the Jewish community before the Nazis came to power, you know, one in three Jews in Europe died in the Shoah. One of one in three Jews was murdered by Hitler, either directly or indirectly during the Shoah. But 90% of the Hasidim were murdered by it during the Shoah. So 90% of the of the more extreme Orthodox Jews, the ones who were very easy to identify, they were the ones who went in, in droves to the gas chambers or were executed over pits in their villages. Like they were the, the ones who suffered the heaviest toll. So I think it's true and the more, and I think October 7th has revealed this, that every single Jew in the world is carrying some degree of Shoah trauma still. How could we not? We're only 80 years removed from the event. So we still are in a world where people witnessed it. That will not be true for today's youngest. Right. Today's youngest kids, well, they will have been born into a world with Holocaust survivors, but they will die in a world without Holocaust survivors. So things are going to change. But right now, we're still second and third generation survivors, all of us. And we are still traumatized by it, which is why I think 
not necessarily to our benefit as a right. people. Right. Many of us are responding to October 7th through a Holocaust lens, uh, uh, which I believe actually has been at least as problematic as it is helpful in terms of understanding what's happening. Because the comparison between Hamas and the Nazis, there are a few important points of comparison that line up, but there's mostly things that I observe that are really different. In some ways, I think Hamas is wor worse. Yes. However, Hamas doesn't have the kind of massive imperial state power to back up its intentions. Uh, wait, wait, well, wait. more than, right. than we thought. More right. Than Right. That, and that's and one of the things I've been talking about. So anyway, my point is that it's largely unhelpful in terms of intellectual rigor to bring a Holocaust frame to what's happening between Israel and Gaza. I don't think that's the main story. No. I do think that part of the main story is that Jews, wherever you are, have Holocaust trauma and are therefore predisposed to see things through a Holocaust lens. Am I still uh, unmuted? Yeah, but it's not only the Holocaust. This That was the most recent event. It has been forever. It has been, but I do think that post-Holocaust, we've seen, you know, the Holocaust fundamentally altered what it meant to be a Jew in the world, as did the creation of the state of Israel. Um, and one of the effects, I believe, is that the the small remnant of very observant Jews who survived the Holocaust and their families, many of them developed a kind of bunker mentality and said, we are going to preserve our way of life in amber right. and became an even more extreme and extremist sect within the greater civilization of the Jewish people. Um, and so, again, that's just a way of affirming what you're saying, that the idea of like a, a very observant Orthodox Jew who nevertheless still served in the U.S. Army does not quite line up with what we've been seeing for decades in Israel, where right. these people kind of like, again, please just accept this as an analogy. I'm not trying to use this too much to give a drash, right. but my drash today in part is that the Haredi resemble Shimon Bar Yochai in that cave, buried in sand, doing nothing but studying Torah and davening. And when they come out, they're not so well equipped to interact with the real world. They're like, what's this farming business? And I'm like, well, farming is like what allows me to be alive. But somebody's got to do it. So the idea that they're disdainful of it, clearly God says, come on, guys, get back in that cave. You haven't learned anything. <laughs> Then they come out, and at least one thing has changed. Shimon Bar Yochai now is like a healer. He's using his mystical god powers to heal. What's he doing with his eyeballs? We don't know. Elazar is still a wrathful individual. But there's something to be said for the appraisal at the end of the paragraph we just read that says, now you've got it. One of you harms and one of you heals. I was a little bit startled when I reread this, a passage with which I'm deeply familiar. But again, going through it again, you start to pick up nuances and phrases that you've never paid attention to before. We're going to go back to the text in a moment. But let's hear from uh, let's hear from uh, Audrey, please. No, I no sorry. Let's hear from Michelle. That's where the hand is. Um, so the, the whole structure of this story is really odd and it's struck me this way when I've heard it before the whole construct of this isolationist hiding in a cave being away from the world is contrary to, for most part I think it's a, it's a rare structure um in Jewish lore first of all second there is the whole um you know the Jews tend not to promote this sort of this traditionally aesthetic De uh, deprived existence um, uh, associated with others. I mean, a week, two weeks ago, we, ju we just read about the Nazarites, and that was, you know, as a limited construct. Now, I know this wasn't forever. This was a dozen years. But um, that whole, like, you're apart from the world, you're doing, is not traditional, is not widely found in Jewish tradition and stories. 
And so I've never quite understood why this whole structure was necessary or useful for 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 this purpose. And it's not like it's a common motif. Yeah, you're right. I don't really have much to say other than that I appreciate what you've observed because it's not something that you see a lot of in the literature. So, I mean, again, clearly the the Talmud is just peppered with all sorts of interesting, self-contained agadot uh, or folklore. And that's what I think this is. This is just one more example of Jewish folklore that some the Stam or some anonymous editor, redactor saw fit to include in the traditions. So the compliment to that is why is this story so popular? Because it is one I have heard as a, with my very limited Talmud experience, there are two or three stories that I, that seem to be the most favorite that come up again and again and again. This one makes less sense to me for that. Well, let's. Let, I mean, I think that's a good thing to sit with. Like, I, I can't account for why certain passages of the Talmud are more popular than others. Um, this is, I think that many people, if you were compiling a kind of like the Babylonian Talmud's greatest hits, this one usually makes the list. Um, some of it is because Shimon Bar Yochai is so famous as a figure. Like, the character of Shimon Bar Yochai has captivated the Jewish imagination for millennia. So much so that, you know, so again, he becomes the figure associated with the Zohar. The, the legend goes that what was he, what was he really doing in that cave? That's where he wrote the Zohar. I guess in between sand pit and davening. In between Torah, he was writing the Zohar down. Okay. Suspend your disbelief. The other, and Shimon Bar Yochai is this revered figure. Uh, his grave is up in the very far north. And every year at Mount Meron, and every year his disciples, um, certain sects within the Haredim, make okay. pilgrimage to his grave. And in fact, several years ago, not that many, but several years ago, there was a terrible stampede and like thousands of people died making pilgrimage to Shimon Bar Yochai's grave on Lagba Omer, which is the time when, remember, the plague was checked during the seven weeks of the Omer. So there's this tradition that Shimon Bar Yochai, I don't remember if it's like his soul propitiates God on your behalf if you visit him on Lagba Omer. I don't follow all these traditions because I think a lot of this is superstitious Narishkeit. But it's in the tradition. So some of it, I think, just has to do with the fact that Shimon Bar Yochai is revered and therefore any little nugget of legend about him, any agada about him in the Talmud takes on a, a certain prominence in the Jewish world. But, you know, I, I don't know. Mark. Um, the, the conclusion of this, of what we've got so far, seems to be that you need both sides. It's, it's sort of like Gevorah and, and Chesed. Um, you need there's first there's wrathful anger and then it has to be balanced by um um but by mercy and that's when you bring the two together that's the um the ideal way of reading Torah. That's exactly yeah. I think what's going on here and I love that you use the Kabbalistic qualities very exactly. fitting for Shimon Bar Yochai of Gevura and Chesed, uh, Gevura which means strength um, and is associated with the quality of like strict judgment, um, and Chesed compassion. Um, and that it is not ideal to have only one or the other. The ideal is the mean between the two or the balance with the two poles of godly behavior, God's own behavior toward people and people's behavior toward each other, striking a balance between compassion and judgment. And I appreciate that. So, by the way, of course, what's being lifted up here is also that Torah study is supposed to happen as a dyad, right? So it, it is also suggesting, I think, that part of the reason we study in Chavura, we study in Chavruta, in groups or pairs, is so that one person can't be an extremist. Like, if, if Shimon Bar Yochai were to have come out, gone into that cave alone and come out alone, and he's studying Torah by himself, the Torah is clearly concerned that that is a recipe for 
total extremism. <laughs> like he would have just been burning stuff with his eyes all day and all night. The idea that optimal Torah study requires another person, presumably to moderate your views. So if your views are too extreme in one direction, your partner moderates in the other direction and vice versa. Okay, mom and dad. As you know, mom and I uh, almost share a birthday with the state of Israel. And <clears throat> it seems to me that the difference now is that for the two millennia since the diaspora, as long as Jews were considered scholars and bankers, there was no penalty for anything you could do to the Jews. Since the foundation of the state of Israel, there is now a penalty. There is a price to be paid for coming after the Jews. And I think that also reflects, you know, uh, something I read, I guess, probably in the New York Times recently, that the people of Israel, despite recognizing the, uh, the tragedies happening in Gaza, are not really that concerned about it. Because, you know, it's now the state of Israel. And if you come after the Jews, there's a price to be paid. Yeah, I think that's all, all totally true. And I would add that, you know, many Israelis who are calling for an end to the war are not doing so primarily out of sympathy for the Palestinians or for, the, for Hamas, who is their enemy. They're doing it because they want the hostages to come home, A. And B, they don't trust Netanyahu and his cronies to prosecute this war in a way that can be separated from Netanyahu's own craven self-interest. I mean, Netanyahu has a corrupt motivation, at least conceivably. Most Israelis understand that he can't separate the motivations to fight the war for the sake of Israel or to fight the war for the sake of not going to prison. So there are many reasons why Israelis are, in fact, it's not that they're not troubled by what's happening in Gaza, though. That is not the primary motivation behind those Israelis who are calling for a, a cessation of hostilities. They're doing so because they believe that that's the best chance of bringing back the more than 100 hostages, dead or alive, who are still in Gaza. Yeah. And because they don't like Netanyahu. It'll be very interesting to see where this uh, decision about the Haredi fighting in the army or serving in the army goes, by the way. I mean... It's fascinating that it has now been ruled illegal for them to sit around and study Torah all day in their Beit Midrash, as it were, with their necks buried uh, buried up to their necks in the sand of Torah study, not engaging in the kemach of serving the Jewish people, not just their soul, but their body. Um, the, the question in my mind is, will it actually happen? What will this do to Netanyahu's coalition? which basically made a deal and said, yeah, you get to be prime minister if you give us the thing we want most, which is that the Haredi don't go into the army. Now that that's broken, can, potentially, again, it hasn't been implemented. So anyone's guess where this goes. All right, let's read on a little bit further because um, there's a little bit more to the story. Um, so we're at the bottom paragraph. Bechade panya de alme shabata chazo hahu saba Dehava Naket. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll pick up here because it's a long sentence. Tre Madane Asa Verachet Ben Hashmashot. All right, in, in, this is all Aramaic, so I'm going to let Steinsalt help us with the translation. As the sun was setting on that Shabbat, uh, they saw, it says, Chazo Hahu Saba. They saw an old grandpa. Some of you may know the word Saba, this word here, grandpa. They saw an old, fo an old guy who was holding two bundles of myrtle branches and running at twilight. So he's got these branches that look pretty and that are fragrant, and he's running at twilight as sun is about to set and Shabbat is about to begin. Uh, and Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Rabbi Elazar say to this man, why do you have these? And he said, uh, Amar leho lichvod Shabbat. Right. Therefore, the kavod for the honor of Shabbat, for the beauty of Shabbat. They replied, just one is enough. Vatiske lach bachad. Why don't you just just have one? And one corresponds to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
And the other, this is the response, corresponds to observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So this grandpa who's carrying these myrtle branches, which I'm not sure what he's going to use them for. Um, like, I do not know what you would do with myrtle branches. I think the point is that he's carrying something and he has to get home very quickly. He's encumbered with these. These aren't like little, I imagine they're like really big. So he's bringing home, is it firewood? I don't know, something he needs for his house. And if he gets caught carrying stuff after Shabbat starts, he's kind of hosed because you're not allowed to carry on the Sabbath. And they're saying, why don't you lighten your burden and carry just one of these huge bundles of myrtle branches? And they're like, no, no, no. I'm observing the mitzvah to the letter of the law. I'm following the Torah literally because there are two places that say how you should remember Shabbat. One says, remember the Sabbath, Zachor et Shabbat. Exodus chapter 20. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, Shamor at Yom HaShabbat, Lekad Show. And by the way, the Shabbat hymn, Lekad Odi, acknowledges this in the very first verse. It says, Shahamor vizachor bedibor echad, right? Which means God said to remember and keep, Shahamor vizachor, keep and remember, bedibor echad with one utterance. This is the, the, poetic way of resolving the discrepancy between the way Shabbat is commanded in the book of Exodus, which is remember the Sabbath, and the way it's commanded in the book of Deuteronomy, which is observe the Sabbath. None of which is the most important thing for understanding this passage. The important thing is that they see this guy encumbered by whatever he's carrying. They're concerned that he's going to violate the Sabbath if he keeps going, which is why he's running. He has to beat the clock so that he can light candles, put his burden down, and it's like, why are you carrying two of these myrtle branches? And he says, I'm doing it out of the honor of Shabbat. Why? I'm both remembering and keeping, one for each. Again, I'm not clear on what he's doing with these branches, and I couldn't find the answer anywhere. But Rabbi Shimon, remember, he's become the moderate voice after the 12-month punishment period in the cave. He says, see how beloved the mitzvot are to Israel. Look at the lengths this guy, this old guy is going to burdening himself with two bundles of myrtle branches just so that he can fulfill Shabbat to the letter of the law. Their minds were put at ease and they were no longer upset that people were not engaged in Torah study. In other words, he sees something, they see something that suggests more than just people sitting around learning Torah. He sees people who are living Torah. They're living Torah values in their way this guy is going out of his way to do something that he believes is lichvod Shabbat for the honor of Shabbat. And they start to settle into this new reality of living in the real world, not being in the sand as masters of Torah. Continuing a little bit. So Rabbi Shimon's son-in-law is a fellow named Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. He heard this story and he went out to greet him. He brought him into the bathhouse Remember, that's the thing that 12 years, no, 13 years earlier, Rabbi Shimon had problems with. Bathhouses, they're homes of licentiousness and prostitution. And that's, the Romans have done this for their own, you know, pleasure. As opposed to, this is actually a kind of nice infrastructural facility in our town. All right. He brought him to the bathhouse and began tending to his flesh. So he's getting a rub down. He's getting a massage, which is what you do in the bathhouse. He saw that Rabbi Shimon had cracks in the skin on his body. So he's giving him a nice, like, you know, lotion treatment, some olive oil, whatever, some citrus, maybe a little salt scrub. He's tending to him, his, his body, not just his Torah mind. And he notices that Shimon is crying and the tears fell from, uh, no, Shimon notices that his son-in-law, Pinchas, is crying. And the tears fell from his eyes and caused Rabbi Shimon pain. Rabbi Pinchas said to Rabbi Shimon, his father-in-law, woe is me that I have seen you like this. In other words, oh my God, you've been sitting in sand for 13 years. Your skin looks awful. Look at how much you've aged. Like, let me help you. It's terrible to see you in this condition. And Rabbi Shimon says, happy are you that you have seen me like this. As had you not seen me like this, you would not have found in me this prominence in Torah. As the Gemara relates, 
At first, when Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai would raise a difficulty, Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, his son-in-law, would respond to his question with 12 answers. But ultimately, when Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair would raise a difficulty, a difficulty here means a conundrum in Torah. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai would respond with 24 answers. So what's going on here? What is, what is this conversation all about that's taking place in the bathhouse over the rubdown? Let me try and give you the important points. So his son-in-law comes along and notices that his father-in-law is in very bad physical condition, right? His skin is completely ravaged from poor nutrition. He's been eating carobs and water hiding in a cave for 13 years. He probably looks very sallow. He steps out of the cave. He probably gets a terrible sunburn. He just looks awful. And as he's giving him this rubdown to try and treat his body, it's like it pains him to see his father-in-law in this condition. And Shimon says, boy, chick, this is important. You need to see not just the scars on my body or the, the my withered skin, but how much Torah I have mastered because of the self-deprivation I put myself through. You know, long ago, before I went into the cave, you would raise a Torah difficulty and I would have 12 answers for you. But now when you raise a Torah difficulty, I can give you 24 answers. In other words, my Torah knowledge has become so capacious that I love the idea that one question could prompt 12 answers, let alone 24. I mean, how Jewish is that? But this is a guy saying, no, no, no. The physical suffering was all worth it because look at what a master of Torah I've become. You need to see that. You need to see that that kind of dedication to Torah is worth any bodily torment that you might put yourself through. I see some of you shaking your heads going, Rabbi, I'm not sure I buy this. But remember who Shimon Bar Yochai is, right? He's the religious extremist who's trying to figure out after 13 years, can he live in the real world or not? His rejection of Rome is what sent him on the lamb in the first place. He hides in a cave up to his neck in sand for 12 years, doing nothing but davening and studying Torah and maybe writing the Zohar, if you believe the legend. He comes out, he's clearly unable to function because he's burning everything in sight. I even don't know if that was intentional. Just everything enrages him, including farming the one thing you need to survive. God says, no, 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 you didn't get it. He goes back in the cave. He becomes a moderate, but he still believes that everything he's been through has all been for the benefit of increasing his ability in Torah. Okay, mom and dad, unmute before you speak. But, but our tradition is definitely anti-mortification of the flesh in order to gain spiritual enlightenment. So this seems contrary to, you know, to Jewish um, uh, practice, evolution, as opposed to other, you know, religions where people march and, and flail their backs with uh, chains and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, this just seems alien to Judaism. I, I accept that, by the way. You know, often when people ask me, well, what does Judaism say about X. And I'm always like, okay, first of all, you're talking to a reform rabbi. So my window into Judaism will not be the same as an Orthodox rabbi, maybe. Secondly, there are so many cases where there's not a single clear-cut answer to that question. Like the, the one that probably sticks out the most in my experience is when people ask me, Rabbi, what does Judaism say about what happens after we die? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well what Jews when, or even what Judaism, where and when. I think if you look at the whole Jewish constel uh, the whole Jewish enterprise over thousands of years in all parts of the globe where Jews have established our civilization, you can say, I, I like the word constellations or emphases. Judaism can be seen to have relative emphasis on certain ideas and relative de-emphasis on other ideas. So what I try to communicate is that whether you're Orthodox, Reform, Conservative, Reconstructionist, or nothing, if you want to know what Judaism says about life after death, it varies widely. 
And it is not true to say what you might have learned as a reformed Jew growing up, that Jews don't believe in an afterlife. But it is also not true to say that what happens after we die is a or even or is the or even a primary consideration of how to live a Jewish life. That's not an answer a lot because people want just a clear cut answer. Rabbi, what is. But I'm like, well, you have to read a semester's worth of reading for you to get a satisfactory answer to that question, because lots of Jews in lots of places, including today, really believe that there's something after we die. And they don't all agree on what that something is. There are some, again, constellations of agreement. But big picture, especially when you look at like Christianity, Christianity centers the afterlife in its religious doctrine. Judaism does not center the afterlife in its religious doctrine generally. So when you get to this idea of Judaism does not generally endorse the mortification of the flesh and an ascetic way of being. It is also true, however, that Judaism is not, as one of my friends, my colleague, Rabbi Seth Limmer, likes to argue, a hedonistic tradition. Seth Limmer, a reform rabbi who's my classmate in Israel, is adamantly anti-kosher. He believes that eating treif fulfills a Jewish value. Like, really? He would say, God would not want us to deprive ourselves of things that are delicious to eat, because Judaism is a hedonistic tradition that appreciates the divine role in the creation of things for human enjoyment. And he'll cite text at you. He says, that's why we fill a cup of wine when we're happy, because we want the sensory pleasure associated with joy. It's why we make big meals on Shabbat, because we want to experience pleasure as we associate it with religious joy. It's why we believe that sexual congress is a mitzvah, at least in certain regulated contexts, right? Because sexual pleasure is not sinful. It's God-given, right? So in all of these ways, he'll argue that, therefore, eating bacon, which is delicious, fulfills a Jewish value. And he's dead serious about it. He's not playing this for laughs. And I take exception to this. And I would say, Seth, the broad, const like, the constellation of agreement in Judaism about treif is that it's treif. As much as I want to, I, I like treif a lot. I want what you're saying to be true, but I can't get behind it. So I think, Dad, you're right that in general, Judaism does not endorse asceticism. It certainly doesn't endorse sequestering yourself in the cave and divorcing yourself from the material concerns of the world, which, by the way, I think is a point that this passage makes. However, the idea that Shimon, he's not transformed in the sense that he now rejects asceticism entirely. And he's saying, no, the mortification of my flesh was a necessary price to become master of Torah. Now, is that a dominant view in Judaism? No. Is it there? What was that old, uh, like, Prego uh, jarred tomato sauce? It's in there. Right? Wasn't that their <laughs> slogan? Like, oh, I want I want my tomato sauce to be chunky with mushrooms and peppers, and yeah. you, it's not just a liquefied goo. It's in there. That was their slogan. I feel like, yeah, in terms of the vast array in the annals of all Jewish writing, there's still substantial writing that suggests that secular life corrupts and Torah life purifies. And there's enough there, there's enough that's in there to allow certain people who are bent toward extremism to begin with to lean into that and say, this is what God really wants from us, which is, of course, how the Haredi today justify it. Right? I, the, the Haredi aren't just complete crazies who have a completely warped view of Judaism. I, I, I think that's unfair. I think the Haredi have enough that's in there where they can say, yeah, God really does want us to sacrifice work, sacrifice pleasure, sacrifice, you know, taking care of our bodies, taking care of our families, and instead rely on the welfare of the state so that we can do one thing, which is bury ourselves in the sand of Torah up to our necks all day, every day. The Supreme Court just disagreed with that premise. Now, again, okay, thank you. That's a long di di discussion, but I think it's not a digression. Um, Mark and Anne in that order, please. I just wanted to point out that Rabbi Shimon 
had a very important mystical pr predecessor in this in Ezekiel, who underwent tremendous mortifications at the direct uh, demand of God. Right. And Ezekiel really is the the paradigmatic mystic of the Jewish tradition. So he's a prophet who's also a priest, but whose prophecy largely consists of wild visions. Like not every prophet is prone to visions. That's that's a misconception. Many prophets in the Bible, I would say the model prophet, you know, the kind of paradigmatic prophet in the Bible is a lawgiver and communicator who tells the people what they're doing right, but mostly what they're doing wrong, which is why Moses is the paradigmatic prophet in the Jewish tradition. But Ezekiel's teaching is based in significant measure on wild psychedelic visions, which has led, by the way, more than a few scholars to conclude that he had schizophrenia or some other significant mental illness, because his prophecies are unlike much of what's in the Bible. They are out there. He has visions that really are wild. Um, but yeah, he's very much the ascetic. And his prophecy becomes the kind of paradigm for a figure like Shimon, Shimon Bar Yochai. Um, great. Okay, Anne, you're up. M unmute. I just, when, you, when we were talking about an afterlife, it reminded me of what I asked, when I asked that about, I asked my grandmother about that. I asked my grandmother, is, is there an afterlife? And uh, she said, this life is a life too. Right, and I and think I, actually... I, that's lovely, Anne. I love that Agada. I love that anecdote. Um, I think that's a very Jewish answer. Like, <laughs> if, if, like that's really good. You've kind of summarized what I think is the trend in Judaism. But you notice I'm choosing my words very carefully. Like, I, I like to talk about trends within Judaism, constellations of meaning, as opposed to definitive up, down, yes, no, black, white answers. You just don't get that. You've got this vast array of literature. And even I am underqualified to say, I've read it all, and I can surmise that the dominant trend is X. Like, I think I can do that with some authority, but I'm willing to be challenged. Again, for my buddy Seth Limmer, sens sensual and sensory pleasure is a core concept of Judaism. For me, it's not. Like, my read on the Jewish tradition is that, no, the pursuit of sensory pleasure, while rarely denigrated, is also rarely elevated to the point where it becomes an overarching religious edict intended to govern Jewish behaviors. Does that make sense, what I'm saying here? Okay, so let's get back to the, the coda. The, the, the passage goes on and on and on and on, but I think there's a nice place for us to end. So we'll read one more small segment. Um, and then we'll have a lovely summer filled with Torah study and sens sensory pleasures. Okay, so Shimon has now had this real life experience. He's seen a man doing something for Shabbat that appears not to be relinked to the direct study of Torah, but he has kind of another aha moment where he's like, oh, this guy is taking a mitzvah very, very seriously. Praise be. Like, maybe there's more to this Torah thing than the cave. Like, this is really a, a long dialogue about, well, what is a life of Torah? Is a life of Torah sequestered in a cave? Or is a life of Torah having to compromise and live in the real world? Obviously, you know what I think. Let's see what the Gemara says. Rabbi Shimon says, since a miracle transpired for me, you can see that, ho'il means since, the itrachish nisa azil, Okay, so itrachish means a miracle happened. A nisa is a nace in Hebrew, nisa in Aramaic. A nisa happened for me, azil. Atkane milta, I'm going to go fix something. Atkane, I'm going to do a tikkun. So this is like, wow. What's the miracle? Is the miracle that he survived the cave? Is the miracle that he was sent back to the cave as punishment to reconsider burning everything with his eyeballs is the miracle that he saw a poor old man gathering wood before Shabbat in order to fulfill the mitzvah of, of Shamor V'Zachor? I think it's that. One way or another, he's acknowledging that something has happened to him that has blessed him. So he's going to go out there, but he doesn't, look what he says. 
He says, I'm going to go fix something in the world. This is an amazing, I think, religious awakening for our Shimon Bar Yochai. And it's why, for me, his character does get redeemed at the end of this story. So, Ad came Milta, I'm going to go out and fix something. And as Steinsalt says, I think accurately, for the sake of others, in gratitude for God's kindness. And here's the proof text. And Jacob came whole to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he graced the countenance of the city. So there's this funny verse in the Torah. It says right here, um, uh, Vayavo Yaakov Shalem. So Jacob came whole. Genesis 33, 18. What's happening in this passage? Let's look to the side. Here they translated as Jacob arrived safely in the city of Shechem. By the way, Shechem is in northern West Bank uh, in Samaria. What it is known in the Palestinian community as Nablus. It's a very significant biblical city, though. So Jacob has been traveling from Padan Aram, which is in modern day Syria, in a southward direction. And he arrives in the city of Shechem. And it says he arrives Shalem, which is really interesting. There's that word, Shalem. You know the word Shalom. It's the same root. It means whole or complete. But here they say he arrives safely, which is probably the idiomatic meaning. He just, you know, travel was hard. So he arrived in one piece in the city of Shechem. But it is an interesting word to have just popping up in this narrative of Jacob and his many adventures. So the rabbis ask, what does this Shalem business mean? The Amar Rav, Rav said, one of the uh, one of the Amoraic sages, you see Rav is a first generation Amora, so much later than Rabbi Shimon. So we're getting a later voice of the Talmud to in, instruct us here, to inform us. Rav said the meaning of Jacob came Shalem is he was whole in body, whole in money, and whole in Torah. So when he arrived in Shalem, he was physically unmolested. He was intact physically. He arrived in one piece, but he hadn't lost any of his money, hadn't been stolen by bandits. So he had his assets and he hadn't forgotten his Torah. So what does he do now that he is Shalem? He graces the countenance of the city which is a poetic way, which is reported in the Torah, meaning he performed gracious acts to benefit the city. What did he do? Well, Rav said he established currency for them. And Shmuel said he established marketplaces for them. You see where this is going. And Rabbi Yochanan said he established bathhouses for them. In other words, he built the infrastructure of a place that people will need not just to survive, but to thrive and have a normal life with normal things in it. Not a cave with sand and a carob tree and some water where you go nuts. You go crazy and you come out and you're destroying things with your eyeballs before being sent back to... So again, Rav Shimon really gets a redemptive character arc here. Comes back and he says, not only have I witnessed a miracle, which is an old man bringing in wood for Shabbat and giving honor to the Sabbath, not only this, I'm going to go out there and do some tikkun in the world. But this is interesting because you might think that Shimon's idea of tikkun is to set up an academy. Right? Okay, let's see what he does. Does he do that? He says, in any event, clearly one for whom a miracle transpires should perform an act of kindness for his neighbors as a sign of gratitude. So if something good happens to you, we would say pay it forward. Do something good for your community. So we asked around, is something around here that needs repair? And they actually said, yeah, there's a place around here where we're not sure whether it is tamay or tahor, whether it is ritually pure or impure. And the priests are troubled by this, so they avoid the place entirely because priests, of course, are prohibited to become ritually impure from contact with a corpse. So there's this, who knows what it is? It's a house, it's an abandoned warehouse. There's some place where... There might have been a dead body. And so Shimon says, is there a person who knows that there was a presumption of ritual purity here? And yeah, there was. And, and I'm going to just kind of like skip to the end. Basically, what happens is he comes around and Shimon ben Yochai purifies this cemetery. 
So there's a cemetery that it's not clear whether or not the cemetery is kosher. And he's still using his Jewish knowledge, but he's actually doing something to improve in an infrastructural way the lives and the welfare of the Jewish community. And that's where I wanted to end. Like this is this is Shimon Bar Yochai's 13 year adventure, running away from the Romans, being punished by God, coming back out and saying, all right, how can I do some good for the community? And what he does is not teach Torah to a bunch of disciples in a cave. He says, no, I have some powers here as a rabbi. I can sanctify a place that has been rendered impure so that the Jewish community has one of its core resources and the priest can actually not avoid it. And this is really important, by the way. When Jewish communities establish themselves, what's the very first thing that Jewish com new Jewish communities do in new places? Does anyone know? This is true. Look at American, look at all of Jewish they said They set up a Hebra Kedisha and they acquire land for a burial ground before they build a synagogue. It's the first thing that Jewish communities do. Most Jewish communities in America did exactly this. They buy land, even up until like the 1960s, during the great synagogue boom of the post-war years in America, new Jewish communities had to make sure, particularly in the Orthodox world, but it became a concern for Reform Jews too, because most Reform Jews do choose to bury themselves and their loved ones in Jewish cemeteries. And the tradition is that a Jewish cemetery contains only Jews. Like Sharon Gardens is a Jewish cemetery. It's part of Kensico. But it is a Jewish cemetery. Only Jews are buried at Sharon Garden Cemetery in Valhalla. And that's because it's owned by the Jewish community, as it were. The, the Jewish community acquires these plots. I think that the temple where my parents used to belong, Bethel in Providence, Rhode Island, they have their own cemetery, right? They also use one in Cranston. Yeah, no, they, uh, it's they want, they're one from uh, Temple Bethel is uh, actually, I think, an old Civil War um, plot. But yes, it's owned by Temple Bethel. And uh, Lincoln Cemetery, the one in Cranston, is one for more, uh, is in Warwick, and it's larger for the larger Jewish community. Right. But it's the first thing that Jews do. So the idea that Shimon Bar Yochai says, well, what around here needs fixing? And somebody says, yeah, we've had this problem. And it turns out it's a cemetery that has become ritually tainted. He's like, well, yeah, I can, I can help you with that. And that's the end of the story for today. I mean, again, there's a lot more in the Gemara about the continuing exploits of Shimon Bar Yochai, but I think that provides kind of a lovely end point. I'll take Trisha's comment. I'll say one or two housekeeping words about uh, where we're going uh, come end of summer. I was just hoping you'd leave me with an even more hopeful note that he was able to temper his son's horrible behavior. <laughs> uh, I do not believe so. I have to go, I have to go and read the rest. I believe that the way it ends is very disturbing. I don't think Elazar comes back, but yes, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering it now. So I'll go and confirm this. But so after this, the next escapade is that Rabbi Shimon says, I want to talk to that Yehuda Ben Gerim guy who turned me into the authorities effectively. Remember Judah, the son of converts? He finds him and it says he gazed at him and Judah turned into a pile of bones. Shabbat Shalom. Right, so again, <laughs> like, well, what did you expect? You've been studying Talmud with me for 34 sessions now. You know that nice, tidy, neat endings are not the Talmud's jam. That is not how this book works. So if you don't like ambiguity, if you don't like fake endings, like, again, I ended on a redemptive arc, but Trish, you pushed me. I had to do it. Yeah, I, I just went and looked at my other browser tab. That's exactly what happens. He seeks out and finds Yehuda ben Gerim, the son of converts, and he burns him to death. And then, by the way, that's actually the end of the passage, and it goes to the next Mishnah. Okay. Wow. Yep. Wow. My friends. I always find uh, meaning, uh, joy, and uh, delight in our gathering to learn. Um, but but I also find meaning, joy, and delight in having some time away from my work. Um, so uh, I'm at the temple next week. 
Please join us in any way you can in welcoming Rabbi Alyssa Platkow to the temple. She begins next week. Um, and she's giving the Devar Torah at Friday night services, which you can uh, attend in the CJL uh, or view through our live stream at 6.15 uh, a week from tomorrow. Tomorrow night's going to be amazing. Um, instead of a Devar Torah, we're kicking off summer with a special musical concert by Pete Malinverney, followed uh, and, and with legendary jazz vocalist Janice Siegel is going to be singing with him. So it's the Pete Malinverney trio featuring Janice Siegel. She's one of the founding members of the Manhattan Transfer. She's awesome. When I asked Pete last week to share a few words about Janice with the congregation, he said in his total Pete way, he said, she uses Grammys for doorstops. So she's a multiple Grammy award winning jazz vocalist. And by the way, no Grammys, but our new assistant rabbi is also a formerly professional cabaret jazz vocalist. Um, so you're going to love getting to know Rabbi Platkow uh, and greeting her and her wife, Miranda, who have moved to Harrison and live very close to the temple. We're very excited about embracing them as members of the WRT family and community and also learning with her and from her, being inspired by her leadership. Um, she didn't uh, go and ritually purify a cemetery, but she was just acknowledged by Jewish Week as one of 36 under 36 uh, Jewish leaders. Um, so a Jewish leader in her young 30s who over her rabbinical uh, studies also established the first non-Orthodox Hever Kedisha or burial society um, in New York. So um, we're really excited for Alyssa's innovation and spirit of service to the Jewish community as well. Um, Every week during the summer, Shabbat services 615, uh, starting in the month of Elul, which is after Labor Day this year. Um, Kenter Kleinman and I will look forward to teaching four weeks of Gemara uh, in readiness for the high holidays together. We did that last year as well. And then after the holidays, I'll pick up the fall semester of Gemara study at our usual Thursday Zoom channel and time, um, where we will be studying um, the Jewish life cycle through the Gemara. So next year's study is all about the cycle from birth to uh, bris, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, bat mitzvah is not so in there, but coming of age, um, marriage, divorce, death, funeral, like all of those main building blocks of real lived Jewish life. Let's find out what the Gemara teaches us and, and why these you know, life cycles are in fact marked the way that we mark them even today, very much indebted to the Gemara. Um, so that's going to be the fall semester. So much good learning coming up. We're dedicating our coming year, 5785, to the theme uh, from strength to strength, writing or telling, the, uh, no, writing the next chapter of our story. Um, so that's going to be uh, uh, the guiding words for WRT this coming year. In the meantime, um, I'm off from July 8th until the end of the month, and then look forward to being with you again in August, but not teaching until after Labor Day. So have a wonderful summer. Shabbat shalom. Oh, Lord, Rabbi. You too. Thanks. Feel better, Mom and Dad. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.